This is a little demo of the Enigma machine wristwatch I made. Um, you can see, this is the watch here. Uh, it's a custom casing I made out of steel. It's all been painted crackle black. And a custom strap I made out of some scrap pieces of leather I had around. Uh, if we switch it on. It comes up with the Enigma logo. Um, and then it functions just the same as a normal three rotor Enigma machine did during World War II. Uh, it's probably easier if I take it off and lay it down so we can actually see how it works. This might be a little bit tricky to film because it's quite hard to focus on the screen, but I can give a rundown of how this Enigma machine watch works. Basically, it's powered by an Arduino and it's driving a little um, OLED screen. The whole thing is completely self-contained. Inside, inside here, there's a little LiPo battery that's powering it all. Um, this is the recharge socket for the, the battery. And basically, it's been set up to work with a three-button interface. So we can switch it on. Uh, it just comes up with the Enigma logo. Now, press the button to continue. Now the way this is set up to work is it's meant to be as if it was a usable device in the field. Now the way they used to use the Enigma machines um, in World War II was they had these, these daily sheets um, of settings. So every month there would be one of these sheets which would give the Enigma operators the, the settings to use for the machine for that day. Um, you can see here it's numbered in days. It's in reverse order so that they could tear off the bottom of the sheet every time they used one of these settings for each day. Um, but if you look at the sheet, basically what it gives you is the rotor settings for that day. So these are which rotors to use in which order. The ring settings for those rotors. The plug board settings. And they had up to 10 pairs. Well, they always had 10 pairs of... Um, letters and then uh, some of the initial settings they could use. So the watch is basically set up um, to work as if you were going from one of these sheets to configure the machine. So the first thing it shows you is the rotor settings. Now the way this works, the user interface is there's a screen for each setting and there's a summary screen and there's an edit screen. So we can select that we want to edit these settings and then we can go in and start selecting our rotor settings. So it shows you the left rotor first. Um, just use the left and right buttons to select the rotor. You can go either direction, of course. Select the left rotor. We can select the middle rotor. Just leave it like that. And we can select the right rotor. Now, as you go through the rotors, the list of selections gets smaller because you've already chosen out of the set of five wheels that you've got. So we will choose that. And then after the last selection, it takes you back to the summary screen so you can check what you've got. Um, now I've chosen these specifically to show another feature of the watch a bit later on. We continue and then we get to the ring settings. And again, you can just go in and edit these. Um, select whatever you want. Middle wheel, right wheel. And then it gives you the summary. And if you're happy with that, you go to the next screen. Now this is for the plug board settings. And this was probably the trickiest thing to do with only a three button interface. So if we go into the edit screen, what this gives you is basically two letters and pressing the button just steps through each of the letters and you can pair them up. So that would be one paired setting. Um, it gives you a total of how many pairs you've, you've done you do all 10 it just takes you straight back to the summary screen to show you what you've selected. Um, you don't have to select 10. Um, obviously in the field they would always use 10. So we can go through and select another pair. Um, now one thing I had to do in the interface here is handle all sorts of strange little edge cases. So if you select a pair where one of the letters has already been selected um, you notice that the, the number of pairings didn't go up 
and that's because it has to break the original pairing and recreate the, the new pairing. So you haven't actually created any, any new links. You've, you've broken one and replaced it with another. Um, if you select a letter and then connect it to itself, nothing will happen. Um, if you pair up one of those letters and then connect one of those back to themselves, the number of connections will go down by one because you've now broken effectively two connections. So normally if you're setting it up from the sheet, you, you would just go through and enter these pairings as they appear here. Um, and you would just enter all 10. So we can enter a few more. Oops. Now when you're finished entering, um, if you've got less than 10, you basically just set it to a clear setting and then it'll exit out. And here it's showing you what pairings you've selected. So if we're happy with those, um, we can go on to the ground settings, which this is basically the initial wheel positions. So we can go in and edit these. And we'll set left wheel. middle wheel and the right wheel and again it shows you the settings next we have the reflector to use um, now there's only two choices here sort of B or C so we just choose the one we want and then we get to the encoding screen so this is showing us the rotor positions in these little windows and which letter we're currently going to encode so if we code a letter it gives us what the encoder version is in the little ticket in the middle. And you can see the rotors have sort of stepped around one. Now, the, um, the Army and Luftwaffe Enigma machines actually had rotors with numbers on them, not letters. Uh, it was the naval Enigma machines that had rotors with letters. So I'm sort of cheating a little bit here by displaying the letters in the little windows. But pretty much every example or... Um, online version of the Enigma machine I could find does the same thing and also so does the the kit that you can buy from Bletchley Park um, also displays the letters rather than the numbers because I guess it's a lot more interesting to see what letters are happening so we can just keep going and encoding letters here um, now the the rotors I chose and the initial settings should show how the rotor turnover works so You see there, both the middle and the right-hand rotor turned over. And that's because the right-hand rotor had got to its, its turnover position. And so that causes the middle one to turn over as well. Now, if we step again, what happened there is a bit tricky, and it's called the double-stepping um, effect. And what actually happened was... The right hand wheel always steps. Um, in certain positions, it will step the middle wheel. If the middle wheel turning over moves the left hand wheel into its turnover position, what happens is on the next transition, the leftmost wheel turns and it sort of pulls the, the middle wheel with it. So that's effectively stepped twice um, within two letters. Now, it looks like it's only affecting that middle wheel. It's actually happening on the right hand wheel as well. So basically the rule is any time a wheel moves, it will pull the wheel on its right around one position as well. The reason you don't really you only really notice it on the middle rotor is because the right hand rotor is turning over anyway every time you, you press the button. So you never notice that that's double stepping. Um, it's kind of an interesting little effect and it takes a little a special little case in the code to handle that but it wasn't too hard to figure out so now that those have turned over we should just keep going and just the right hand wheel will turn um, you can see as you you code different letters 
they're appearing on this ticker here in the middle. And that's displaying them in groups of five letters because that's how they were actually transmitted um, via radio. Once they've been encoded, they were transmitted in groups of five. So in here, we've got another couple of little settings. We can just clear that ticker and we can also exit. And that takes you back to the settings screen. Um, if we go through here again, you can see that the ground setting now is set to um, what we'd finished up on after we'd done some encoding. So you could then go in here and edit that and set those back to the initial setting if you wanted to. Um, it just goes back through into the encoding. So one interesting thing to note is this, um, this font that I've used. So the, the graphics library I'm using actually lets you define your own fonts. Uh, it took a little bit of fiddling around. You have to find the fonts in a, a strange format and then muck around with them a little bit to get it to work. But I was able to upload my own font. And this font uh, is a Gothic one and it's called Fraktur. Now it's kind of an interesting one because when you look at it, it's, it's kind of a, it makes you think of a German font. Um, you know, effectively a Nazi German font, but it actually isn't. Um, it's been around a lot longer than the Nazis were. And the Nazis didn't actually like it, and they were trying to, to get rid of it and not use it anywhere. But it's a kind of strange one in that it turns up in all sorts of strange places. So the original uh, code books that they used on the submarines, for example, on the heading page uses this font. So it's kind of got an interesting history. It's an interesting one to look up. Um, but it seemed like the most appropriate one to use for this device. Uh, all the headings and things are in German, of course, which also presents some problems because the, the screen, uh, it's only a tiny little screen. I don't have much resolution. And trying to find short German words for things is, is, can be quite a challenge. Um, but that's basically how the machine works. Uh, you can go in, change things, reset things. Um, if you need to reset all the way back to the beginning, you just sort of turn it off and turn it back on again. But basically it functions exactly the same as a, a World War II Enigma machine did. That's that.